let's get started. I'm going to hand over in a minute to uh, Roderick Sadler from La Trobe University. With him are Charlie Ambrose and Simon Huggett. They're a great team and they've done some really interesting work that Roderick's going to tell you about. So I'm just going to hand over now to Roderick Sadler from La Trobe University. Thank you very much, Simon. We've got this, this Claiming the Territory title, and that's, that's come, come out of a, of, a, of a comment I made in our recent uh, video presentation that you put together. So I guess it's, it's led me to think about lots of different aspects of Claiming the Territory that have been, have been part of this project. Um, and I've actually prepared material looking at one particular aspect of that. But, but what I suppose what was um, what the comment originally referred to was was the notion that um, putting research data material out uh, and making it available is actually it's actually an, an assertive act. It's an act of claiming a territory, and we've certainly come across uh, a lot of researchers who are, are concerned that that it puts them in a in a vulnerable position, that it makes them um, that's revealing their material and perhaps compromising their ability to, to exploit it um, ahead of, of other people who may, get, may take that opportunity. So um, I guess we're still working on, the, on that idea. How do, we, um, how do we turn that into a sellable proposition and how do we, how do we give researchers the tools to be, to be confident with taking that sort of step? Certainly it's still a comment that we're hearing um, from quite senior academics that, that there are concerns that um, Exposing your material before you've you've actually worked it thoroughly is is something that they have concerns about. So it's it's not something that we can say we've we've dealt with. It's something we're still actively working on. Um, but the notion of, of claiming the territory led me to a lot of a, a lot of other thoughts. I mean, we're we're dealing with in Trove here. We're dealing with our metadata stores project as a library a library based project. I mean the other projects I know have um, been steered from other parts of their institutions, um, but to me, it's it's quite a um, it, it is a claiming the territory exercise for a library to be doing this kind of work. As we've been going through the projects, um, so many aspects of it are really reworking of of traditional library tasks using traditional uh, library-based skills. Um, it's it's basically, in in a sense, it's a, it's a new form of of, of librarianship. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of territory that, that we should be claiming. Um, so man management of identities, um, describing materials, all that sort of thing. It's it's library library work from time immemorial. What I wanted to focus on was was what I suppose emerged out of this project as. As the big sleeper, it's the it's the thing that we we probably didn't see coming from an early point, but it's turned out to be more and more of an issue, I suppose, which is the um, the researcher identification management. Now, I guess we're at a time at the moment with um, um, the rise of social networking and so forth, where there are so many avenues for for people to um, for for the identification of people to either through their own Efforts, or through the efforts of other organisations and so forth, to become um, described in one way or another, and and that, those seem to have become uh, sort of an uncoordinated mess in some respects. I'll just go through, through some screenshots to give um, some example of the territory that we're looking at, and to to start thinking about how we can claim it. I guess so. Um, oops. So I've just clicked onto a page. It's just a screenshot from Thompson uh, Thompson's researcherid.com. So we've got a record here for a Latrobe academic, quite a senior academic, uh, and he's he's done work on his own behalf to to get himself a researcher ID allocated, obviously through the through the through Thompson to a commercial company. Um, now Latrobe has had. Pretty minimal take up from academics for for this service, um, but this is one this is one academic who has taken this step. So he's built himself a profile and he's allocated a number of pu publications. Obviously, I couldn't fit his publication list into a screenshot, but so he's he's one who's got himself uh, a researcher ID. 
via Thompson's. Um, the next next screenshot is a Latrobe researcher who's built himself a ResearchGate profile. So again, his own initiative. He's done something, I suppose, comparable to um, what the previous one did um, through Thompson's um, researcher ID. So he's he's put together a profile of himself. Again, of course, the publication list can't fit in the screenshot. So we've, we've gone from Thompson's to ResearchGate. Now, a totally different sort of enterprise. Um, Thompson's being, obviously, they're making researcherid.com um, a freely avail available service. Still coming out of from quite a different sector. Uh, then we move on to another Latrobe academic who's built himself a profile through Microsoft Academic Search. So he's done quite a bit of work, put it in a very um, fetching photo of himself, and um, he's built quite a profile in the system for himself. Now, I think Simon, if, sorry, I'm just going to talk a little off the side here. Simon Huggard, um, does he, did he, have you spoken to him about him using this as a, a primary sort of profile page? Um, I've, I've talked to him about what he's, he's used, and he said he he tried a few different sort of um, profile sites, uh, and sort of some of them you can see. I looked at a number of them, and uh, you could see some of them. He went in there and did something at one point, and then obviously it, it didn't sort of meet his needs, and he's only done a couple of things, added a few things, and then gone on to something else. And I think there's a couple of ones that he is using. I think Google Scholar and uh, Microsoft Academic are the ones he's actually, I think, actively looking at. And I think uh, the other thing about those profile pages is that they also, they work on you. They send you emails, they say someone looked at your profile, someone commented on this, there's a new uh, publication that might be yours here, you might want to claim that, all, all these sort of things. And so there's there's some that are quite active and some that, are, that you don't, where not much happens unless you actually work on them. So he, he tried them out and was interested in, in you know, Sort of publicising what he's done and putting a bit of a profile out there. So there's a couple he is actively using. Okay, so moving on from Hilton, um, this is another low trade academic. No, no photo this time, but he's he's actually built himself a, a Google Scholar profile. So um, he's um, again put together uh, citations, etc. He's brought them together under one identity. Um, and another one in, in Google Scholar. He's been quite active in building his profile here. So he's he's taken the trouble of putting a photo in and so forth. So for each of these, um, these, these academics are um, acquiring um, IDs in different systems. Um, but but these are all these are all uncoordinated and unmanaged. So the same one, sorry, I'll just go back again. Um, so so Russ, Russell Hoy, sorry, I'll just put in. So uh, Russell Hoy, we just looked at through Google Scholar. Um, we'll start looking at him now through a different structure of um, of identification. So, so the uh, ISNI identifier. So Russ, Russell Hoy has an ISNI identifier. So the International Standard um, uh, Name Identification um, System, which is a, a quite a new initiative, but it's a it's a very high level initiative. So. So it's um, this particular interface we're looking at is powered by OCLC. Now, in the library world, you don't get a lot bigger than OCLC. Uh, and ISNI is, is based in uh, has an international standard as its basis. So, so um, in contrast to the, the sort of commercial efforts with um, through Thomson's um, and the community-based ones, um, we now have uh, a very high-level, organised sort of approach to, to uh, identification management. So we've got a, a, an ISNI record here for Russell Hoy. Uh, and the same researcher again. So now this is the VIAF, a VIAF record for Russell Hoy. So this is the virtual international authority file. So we've, I in a sense, we've moved down a level. So um, and I'll just click through. We've got some more detail. So. So this is back to the to some detail from the ISNI record. So the ISNI record is actually sourced from the VIAF record. So I'll just click back a couple of slides. So so the ISNI record here, with its various details, is is generated through that from that VIAF record. 
So we've got this sort of hierarchy, um, easily kind of locating itself at, at the broadest level. Um, so there's some other sources there listed for the um, for the VIAF record as well. So VIAF is um, highlighted one here. Um, so now the VIAF record in turn is sourced from a record from the National Library of Australia. So over on the right we've got a little diagram there of um, this sort of structure of sources for this record and on the left we've got we've got them listed. Um, so <coughs> this this VIAF record for, for Russell Hoy has has been put together from a number of different sources. Now this is starting to sound familiar when, when you've done anything with the, the National um, Library's party infrastructure. So it's a kind of um, a conglomeration sort of effect. So the VIAF record, um, this is the record history. These are obviously screenshots attached to the same record. So there are there's quite a lengthy list of record IDs there. Um, some of them occur several times because there's some deletions and so forth. But but that VIAF record has has been put together out of out of work over quite a number of, of different records from different sources. So there's an awful lot of work going on out there in this kind of um, this identification management. A lot of different agencies, um, a lot of them working at a national and international level, and they're actually trying to trying to coordinate their efforts, which is something that's quite a novelty for someone who's been working in in um, the library world for some time. To see all of these agencies coordinate is quite extraordinary. So from the VIAF record, so uh, as we saw, the VIAF record had a um, had the National Library of Australia, as I've, I've highlighted there. National Library of Australia is one of the sources for the VIAF record, so I'll flick through that one. So this is the the National Library of Australia um, people system display for that um, for that record. So so Russell Hoy again. So he's making this is really following him all the way down the hierarchy, I suppose, from from ISNI through VIAF down through uh, to the National Library. So the um, the Trove record lists three um, identifiers for this person. I suppose whether you describe it as an identifier for a person or for a record is a, is a moot point. But anyway, um, so we've got two two Libraries Australia identifiers in this case, um, which is a little unusual. I think he was described twice uh, erroneously. Anyway, and. Um, Anyone who's familiar with the party infrastructure will see how the um, the, familiar, the familiar form of the NLA um, dot party identifier at the the bottom of that list of identifiers. So so he's found his way into the party infrastructure out of the Libraries Australia infrastructure. So um, and he's found his way right up to the ISNI infrastructure through VIAF as well. So when we look at the Libraries Australia record, now it takes another twist. Um, the Libraries Australia Authority record is originally a Library of Congress record. So we've got this extraordinary twisting and turning going on with this identification of this one person. <coughs> so um, the LC number field there is indicating Library of Congress number. So if we trace that one back, so Library of Congress has a record for the same person. So. So we've got Russell Hoy described in many and various places, but um, some some linking, some working independently. So we can see this there's this interconnection going on. Um, it's not always um, two-way. The the Library of Congress record, for instance, doesn't have any reference at all to the um, Libraries Australia record. The Libraries Australia record refers back to this one, and then the National Library Party Infrastructure record refers back to the um, to the Libraries Australia record, but the Libraries Australia one doesn't refer the other way to the parties record. So now, just to, to to add to this kind of proliferation of identifiers from all these different sectors, we have our own local version of a party record. So this is the Latrobe approach. We've got um, what we're doing here is I'm just looking at the lower part of the screen. We've got um, I'll just look at the external ones first. So we've got a Trove record link. So, so this 
So this record is aligned with a, a trove record. So we've included that. Now this is this is a public record in our in our repository system. So this is part of this is actually part of our meta, metadata store infrastructure, as we've realised it through our um, our Latrobe repository. So we've actually modified the display so that it, it takes a trove link and um, puts it in the public display with a link. We can incorporate a VIAF record link as well. So it can go to the NLA um, level, it can jump up to the VIAF level. Then off to the side we have um, a Scopus record ID. Scopus obviously being a, a commercial organisation. Um, so sitting outside that structure, but yet we we've taken the decision to incorporate all of these IDs in the same record. And at the bottom we have an, an ISNI identifier. Now as far as I know, ISNI identifiers are not um, currently, it cannot currently be resolved as URLs, but they are intended to be um, to be unique in identification um, for researchers in the world. So something like an ISBN for a book where it's not something you can resolve to URL, but it is intended to be to be unique. So, so out of all of that, um, obviously the, the the new one to the mix is is our local record ID. So, now we we're working with Redbox and Mint in the back end. So, um, the records we have in here need to coordinate with our with our Mint records um, when it comes to identifying researchers. So. So um, the identifier there, for anyone familiar with Mint, is probably not going to look familiar as a Mint identifier. Usually a Mint identifier will be um, uh, along um, a hash, uh, hash key. So it's, it's derived out of something um, deep within the technical workings of the Mint system, put together intended to be, intended to become something unique, but, but to us it was, it was um, it wasn't something that was going to help pull our systems together. So we, we wanted to, to push the records out into this public interface. Um, so what we've done with our local ID is we've we've taken um, an ID identification number from, from Latrobe's um, research management system, so our research master system, and we've prepended pre the Latrobe ISIL code to that. So the AU hyphen VLU is what we've prepended to that to um, to make our records specific to Latrobe. So obviously, if we're pushing if we're pushing a party record out to say National Library and we just put a Research Master ten digit numerical code there, perfectly possible that could that could um, be the same as, as another one someone else contributed. So we've we've taken this step of um, of Trying to ensure uniqueness by by putting identification in that form. So um, that that's the form of um, identif identifier is the one that's going to be the key that we send up to um, to the national library in our, as a so we we actually are contributing EAC CPF records to the national library, and we're using identifiers of that form as our primary match point. So. Um, so the, the idea of that is that we can at any at any point where we see one of our records we can we can readily take it back to the um, original source. So so we just take off the ISIL code and we have the um, the research master identifier. Uh, now the thing about the research master identifier is that it actually enables us to coordinate party records with um, not only our research data records. Where we're explicitly adding the identifiers, but um, but also the uh, publication records coming out of our our research master system, so they all come with um, with uh, research identifiers as well. So this is actually building a system where we can pull together this whole kind of um, this whole ecosystem of of, of data about Latrobe's research output. So by by building our research identification around this this number, it, it actually enables us to coordinate identification of, of publication records, which are also in our repository system, with um, 
with research collection records, which will be here as well, and and to push those um, those records out to the National Library and maintain those uh, those linkages. So um, we we haven't gotten a lot further at this stage than than I guess in incorporating all of these these records. I mean, there are still some open questions about. Um, the proper kind of markup for some of these identification, uh, those identifiers, like a Scopus ID and so forth. I mean, it, it looks like it's just a pretty vanilla um, field that you include in a record at this stage, so rather than being formally identified. But anyway, this is the kind of work that we're attempting to to do. We're trying to bring together these identifiers. Now, um, this particular researcher didn't have a uh, a researcher ID identifier. Um, we looked at one previously who did have, but um, this one doesn't have. Otherwise, we, we would have incorporated that as well. Uh, and this one doesn't have an ORCID ID either. So I guess there are a lot of questions there about, are, are we going to continue trying to keep all of these balls in the air? I suppose it's the, you know, the kind of territory we're looking at. If we come back to the notion of claiming the territory, we are looking at researchers who are in some cases quite active in, ma in managing their own profiles. They're out there on these other systems like Google Scholar, Thomson's Researcher ID, um, ResearchGate, various others. They're managing their own identities out there. So I suppose the sort of thinking we've had here is that we have to engage with that or we're just going to be out of the picture. So we, we're not in a position to, to um, require them to to restrict their activities to one system or another, or to impose another system on them. So we're trying to make our work complementary to what they're already engaged with. I guess that's, is that, would you say that's a reasonable way of putting it, Simon? Yeah. 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 So we, we're trying to we're trying to engage with the the, um, the landscape that, that our researchers are engaged with. So um, so pulling those identifiers into our system, hopefully, is a way of making our our records um, relevant to the sort of things that they're doing um, in these various other initiatives. And I guess ultimately um, when these records are pushed to RDA, to Research Data Australia, it will also push those identifiers out there and and you know the, the data is out there in the public domain. So if that researcher wants to yeah, promote them, their work and claim their work, claim the territory in different systems, they can do that and we're integrating with that as much as possible. So I guess there's still um, there seem to be some issues about when you know when um, party records are pushed from NLA to RDA or back again or I mean there seems to be there seems to be data that gets lost um, somehow in transit that, that's something we're still working out for ourselves like what's the what's the approach that we can take that will in will keep the best integrity for the sort of um, work we're doing. So we don't want to be putting, putting various elements in our records and find that they disappear when they get moved from one system to another. So we're still working that out. We haven't come up to any, you know, we haven't um, finalised our approach to, to some of these things yet, but this is kind of the kind of direction we're heading, I guess, it's fair to say. Now, um, okay, so we're looking at something specific to do with our research master to Redbox slash Mint to our repository to the NLA to that connection. So we've got some slides about how our, our metadata store is being configured to to keep this um, researcher identity consistent as it goes through each component of the system. So just just um, recapitulating there that if I, our ISO code for the trove is our I guess that's part of claiming our territory too. We're sticking our brand on our research ID, no, 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 no. Um, and so we're we're associating that with our um, our the, the researcher ID that Latrobe's familiar with. So um, excuse me so a minute, minute Rodri. Yes, Rodri, just excuse yes. me a minute. Somebody's got their microphone unmuted, so we can hear conversation in the background. Can, you, can everybody mute themselves? Okay, let's try that. No, I still hear conversation. That might have been us. I'll try. I'm not sure. Okay. 
Away you go. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Simon. So, um, so we're just we're just looking in a bit more detail at at how we've put together our local identifiers and how we push them through our systems. So, so we've got our ISO code there, and we we um, concatenate it with with a an institutional ID for the um, for the researcher. So we've got our um, we've got um, CSV file that we've we've pulled out of Research Master. So we've got highlighted in yellow just about the middle there, um, Peter Tate, and um, so we've at this stage we've just got the on the left hand side we've just got the the raw um, institutional identifier for this researcher. So that's that's unique in the Latrobe context, but obviously not not necessarily beyond Latrobe. So as we move through, um, we go through to to the red box mint view. Was well, is the mint view, obviously. Um, so so towards the bottom of the page, we've got boxed in red there um, several instances several instances of um, of our reworked version of that identifier. So so we've actually we've got the AU dash VLU um, ISO code for Latrobe prepended now. So whereas previously we had the previously we just had the ten digit code with the, the five leading zeros, now we have the ISO code and and that same identifier. So this is what we we're going to be using as our primary identifier for this this research. So um, so there are various other identifiers that that um, Redbox creates, and uh, invariably they involve a, an extremely long um, hash key. So, so our decision is um, it's 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 more readable, it's more portable, it makes sense across our different systems to to work with a different identifier. So I'm just passing over to Charlie. I'm going to just add to that and say that that um, what appears here as known IDs would previously have looked something like what we've got. For the storage ID, it is, looks, looks like a hash value. Okay, so so this is the, the Mint view. So we've gone from the Research Master CSV extract through to the Mint view, and um, so now we've just got a view of the um, uh, configuration that, that we did in the Mint, or Charlie really did in the Mint, um, to, to make the change to get the to get the um, our, our defined identifier as the as the key one in this process, so um, the standard mint behavior record gets pushed up to NLA is to is to look for what it thinks as it, what it thinks of as the identifier for the for the researcher. So that would be, as as Charlie said, that would typically have been something along one of those values towards the top of the record. Um, that's what Mint would have expected to have been to have been sent to NLA. Now, in our model, um, we, we've actually uh, worked around, I suppose, the the Mint standard processes in the sense that we've we've actually we haven't pushed party records from Mint into our repository system. Now, we looked at a repository system um, party record before. That's actually um, populated from a a parallel process. So, so when the records are um, are put together out of out of Research Master, they go in two different directions. They go they go into um, into the vital um, repository system, and they in parallel they go into the Mint system. But they they have the same identifier. So that's our way of pulling them together. So the OAI harvest from NLA is actually out of our our vital Fedora repository. So um, <clears throat> when we come to use an identifier out of Mint, to use a party record, and it, it doesn't have an NLA identifier attached to it, it will do its process of, of going up to NLA to look for one. So to look for its ident the identifier that it's configured to search for through an SRU query and pull back an NLA identifier. So, so what we've done um, using this code is to um, is to change what's stored for, uh, what's searched for. So we've 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 changed the um, the value that will go into the SAU query. So it will go off looking for one of those AU dash 
VLU000, etc. identifiers, which is what we've, we, will have, we will have pushed that up to NLA out of our vital um, repository using the OII harvest. Um, and that's what Mint will, Mint will coordinate with that to pull back the NLA identifier. Now, that, it sounds like a, a sort of roundabout process, but it's actually worked quite smoothly for us. We've, um, we've actually, I suppose, quarantined the use that we've made of Mint. Um, we, haven't led, we haven't let Mint and Redbox lead what we're doing here. We've, we've actually, I suppose, configured them to fit into the processes that we wanted to run. So, um, but we've actually managed to get them to fit in quite well with the, with the approach we've taken. So, so we've got OAI harvesting concentrated in our repository system. So we're already we're already using that system for other other OAI harvesting. Now we're extending it to use it for um, EAC CPF and for RIF CS. And so far, that's actually worked very smoothly for us. So that coordination um, between between the OAI harvesting out of the repository and the um, the SAU lookups and um, and the bringing back of the NLA identifiers into Mint has actually worked very smoothly. So we've been quite happy with that, with that result. Um, but it did take some system configuration work to, to get that happening. So credit to Charlie basically for sorting that out. So I guess that's one of the ways that we've, we've differentiated our, our implementation of Redbox and Mint is that we've, we've actually um, got it coordinating with a, a bigger process, I suppose. We haven't taken the out-of-the-box sort of processes that it runs with. We've, we've come up with our own process of processes and we've, we've configured Redbox and Mint to work with that. So I guess that's the essence of, um, of how we're keeping our identifiers um, in a form that um, you know, is meaning, meaningful to us but, and not just in the Redbox Mint system. So I guess that's... Um, that's the essence of um, of what I had prepared in terms of slides and so forth. Now, Simon, did you want to um, pick up and say anything further? Um, thanks, Robbie. I guess just to, to wrap up. Um, so the yes, one look. I, I, yep. I, I, yep. Oh, the other Simon. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's all right. So it's, <laughs> it's Simon Huggard here. Um, I'll just say a couple of things, and then we'll hand over to Simon Pockley to you know arrange to mention about questions and things and how we're going for time, but I guess uh, the thing we have to sort out here is to as to how what level do we manage those identities and all of the the different external systems that people are using. So we had to we have to go in and edit those uh, records, party records for people to add those identifiers in, and then because we do that work, it gets pushed out to the systems that we want that to be exposed in. Uh, and therefore, you know, we have to look at how much work it's going to be to actually manage all of that stuff and how we resource, uh, you know, managing those identifiers. But the university sees that as a, a really important thing that we should be doing. So I'm hoping that that means they'll provide some resources and support for us to be able to do that at some point. So, you know, this is a, at this stage we're looking at that and demonstrating that's what we can do and then we, we figure out if, if we can manage that across, you know, 5,000 researchers at the Trove, or whoever the number of, of, of people we have. So, Charlie, did you want to say anything? We're done. Okay, so I think we're done, Simon, and do we want to... I'll hand over to you for ask for questions. Uh, well, uh, Simon, thank you, uh, and Roderick, thank you for that, Charlie, as well. Um, I, I'll start with a question. Well, it, can I just say, if you haven't got a microphone, please use the chat box for any questions you have. Um, if you have seen the video that we made uh, a week or so ago, uh, I found it extraordinary because we, we had a, a, quite a lot of, foot, uh, of material there that I had to edit down. And one of the things that Simon Huggard said was that one of the core challenges that they had at La Trobe with their metadata stores project was actually getting the collections from researchers, getting the, co the researchers in, in, engaged. <laughs> What Roderick's been describing is very much the sort of under the bonnet side of building researcher profiles. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how researcher profiles fit into the Latrobe vision and just how, how important are they as a driver for that engagement with researchers? 
Well, I've, I've just been generously handed the microphone from Roderick. Um, so it's Simon Huggett here again. The the researcher profile side of things is still reasonably undeveloped, underdeveloped at La Trobe. Um, so we're in a, a very good position, I think, to be able to engage with researchers and say if we manage their identities, manage their publications, manage their research data collections, and the research data uh, that they that they want us to curate and make available, then we can provide uh, researcher profiles either from directly from our repository, which is what we're able to demonstrate now, but it's it needs some styling and some work to, to improve the look of it, or pushing that out to other systems at La Trobe to be able to uh, you know allow researchers to, to manage their own identities in some ways and and profiles and and uh, you know use other systems that sort of do that that work a lot better. So uh, the La Trobe has a has just gone through a, a a, content, a web content management system implementation that took a couple of years and part of that implementation was getting uh, researcher profiles out there on the website so that researchers themselves can log in and uh, you know, create a, a description of themselves, put their publications out there and describe what they're doing in their research areas. But at the moment that's a, that's a completely manual process so each researcher can go in, edit their page, they have to manually cut and paste all of their publications into that page and save it, so it's extremely inefficient. So we're seeing uh, the work we're doing here as a way of saying, look, we can demonstrate how some of this work can be done from, or a lot of it can be done from the repository and data pushed out to the right places and managed to, to help researchers with their profiles. So I guess what, what you've seen today is probably, uh, you know, the, the, the bare bones of it. You can see that we've, we can demonstrate, um, we can pull in you know, profiles from, from different areas and different external systems. We see that as a key, you know, selling point to researchers because they're, they're obviously engaged with what, what uh, you know, the different systems are out there and what they can provide for them. And, and, there's a, and if we can say, well, we're in this space and we can manage some of that for you, that's a big, a big boon for academics because they, their workloads are very high. They, they have little time to manage this kind of stuff and we, we're at the moment providing resources and being able to do that kind of for them. So, um, they, so researchers do, they do get excited about, you know, when we talk about profiles and being able to manage things for them, but we, you know, we're still in a process of, of figuring out how we might do that. Thank you. Um, if anyone has, with a mic has questions, please unmute yourselves and speak up, otherwise use the chat. Um, Unless uh, anyone, well, in the meantime, I have another question uh, for Roderick. And this is really, it's another claiming the territory question, and it's re related to something you said uh, when we did the video uh, about the change in the library as, as it becomes the first publisher. Can you expand a bit on that, the, the sort of changes you're seeing that the library ha has to make? as a first publisher? Well, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's almost, um, it's a bit of a back to the future kind of situation because um, at La Trobe, with the, with the cataloguing work that's done here, it, with regard to the regular collection, the emphasis was going um, away from working with identity with authority records it's going away from that kind of that control sort of work uh, and just simplifying more and more uh, and assuming that everything would just fall into place so um, what's happened now with this project um, is that suddenly authority works back in the frame again it's back as a, a central task so managing these records identifying people uh, this unambiguous identification of researchers is now back um, as a central part of the of the discipline of what we're doing so um, it's this and it's because we're in that role now so we we can't assume that uh, everything we're dealing with has been de already dealt with by someone else so if you're doing normal cataloging work you'd assume that anything you're cataloging anything you're handling has probably been cataloged by the Library of Congress or National Library of Australia or or whatever, so so you're down to a very minimal task. Um, 
but when you start dealing with, say, research data collections, and um, you're dealing with, uh, you know, obviously you need to associate the correct researcher with the, the correct, you know, the collection, etc. So now we're back to, uh, in a sense, we're back to that kind of um, high-level cataloging work that was was slipping out of favour in the library in the library context. But we need to um, we need to uh, recover those sort of those sort of skills with, along with skills with dealing with, um, in some cases, quite complex digital content and uh, engaging with quite complex research work. So we need to find, um, I guess we need to find the language for dealing with all that kind of thing. It's not just a matter of dealing with a different, um, different metadata schemas or that sort of thing. It's also finding the, I guess it's finding a way of actually talking to the researchers because we, we, we're not going to be building um, decent uh, collection descriptions if we're not talking to the researchers. If you have a book in hand that you're cataloging, uh, more, more often than not, you will just, you will just um, do it yourself. But if you're dealing with a, a collection, um, when you're the publisher, you're the one who has to make the decisions about the kind of structure you put around it. Like, I mean, there are, there are very fundamental questions like, what is your collection? At the moment, we've, we've um, been given a lot of material from a, from a uh, research centre which has uh, quite recently wound up, but it, it had a lot of valuable research material in it. So it's a, it's a pretty fundamental question. Like, what do you call your collection? Is the entire thing a collection? That's of pretty limited value. Um, I mean, it, it might be value. It might be a value to, to have one description at that level, but then it's been a question that um, people in libraries have had to ask for a long time. You know, where, where do you actually target your description? So I think for that collection, we, we're going to have to to look at um, at multiple collections to to give more meaningful descriptions, because no one else is going to be doing it. I mean, we're the ones who are going to be doing it, and if we don't if we don't do it well, no one else is going to be doing a better job of it. So if we mess it up, then um, you know, we've messed it up for the world, basically. We've, we've let down those researchers. So I'll pass on to Sam. He wants to say something. Um, I think just also one of the things is the researchers themselves um, have a big ownership uh, around their data that they want to publish. And so they do, um, you know, they're very keen for us to put it somewhere, put a DOI around it, make it available, publish it. So that's that at claiming the territory and being able to sort of publish things for the first time. But they do, uh, you know, they they get worried about how, how their data is uh, exposed and described and the rest of it and who's going to get access to it, which is, you know, quite rightly so. So it is, as Roderick was saying, it's important to get that right and make it available. But they are, they are very engaged with that because uh, we're seeing, I think, with some discussions with people, there, there, there are some journals which are asking for the data as part of the review process of, of um, when you, a paper is submitted for publication, so the data is made available so that the reviewer can look at that and verify the, the uh, results in the paper itself and therefore accept it for publication. So if the library can be within that space as well, we're engaging with the researcher as soon as they publish or when they're about to publish or just or before they publish, we're getting their data at the same time, we're providing value in that process and that's that's really important to, uh, as a part of engaging with uh, our researchers and what they're doing. Are, are there any skills um, that, that the data librarians don't have that you need to train them up in when it comes to data? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. We, we have a, an interesting mix of people in our group at the moment that have you know, really good skills around analysing, you know, data itself and exposing it and putting it, making it available on IT systems, that kind of thing. So it's, it's probably those skills that we would need to, to beef up in, uh, you know, a metadata librarian that would be dealing with the data and, and looking at it and being, and having to describe it and make it available. So, uh, but I, I see it as a kind of team approach. I wouldn't say, say that you have to have one person that has all of those skills. It really does you know, is a matter of the team looking at things and, and the, the people who are specialists in certain areas providing advice and, and help in that regard. I mean, I think there's there's too much sort of, you know, in our experience so far, there's already too much diverse data and uh, that we're seeing from different projects for any one of us to to understand it all. 
um, and, and by having a, a group of people who sort of have a mix of uh, you know librarian skills, just description and de dealing with information and information management as well as you know file management and, and data and data sources and then you know servers and systems and making things available. You, you, you know, you're not going to have one person that's going to have that. Having a, a team that can cover all of that is really important. Mm. Uh, I think Jia Bin has a question. Simon, I'd like to know your metadata store project as a project itself will finish soon. So do you want to talk about how to make it long-term sustainable at Latrobe? Yep, so how are we going to make the, the metadata store sustainable as a long-term thing at Latrobe? Um, yes. So in terms of, uh, so we have the processes in place now to be able to manage the, the metadata store. So the, the thing that the uh, the issue that's coming up now, which I guess is common across uh, these projects, is you know how do we how do we resource getting people out there and talking to researchers to to uh, find out what the research they're doing, what collections they have, how they want to expose their data and, and make it available in the metadata store. So there's that. How do we sustain that resourcing? And then there's the issue of um, having the staff at our end to deal with what we're being given, what's coming into our our repository. So uh, that, that's a good question that we're going to have to, to manage. Uh, the, the approach at Latrobe is to um, where we're going with. Let me let me think about this for a second. We're dealing. We're trying to, I guess, work with the research services office, the research office at Latrobe, and the office of e-research. So a collaborative approach with them, and to some degree with ICT to to kind of share that load about. Uh, making contact with researchers, dealing with their data, dealing with you know the questions that they have, um, and making the connections so uh, so that we're not doing all the work. So if someone um, is having a conversation with a researcher, then uh, they can refer that them to us. Um, but that's that's kind of the the sort of research data management sort of area and systems that kind of thing. But we're also um, now working with our liaison librarians to get them to be our advocates and, and talk about because they're, they're dealing with researchers anyway in terms of uh, you know literature searches grant support uh, you know all sorts of areas through the you know publishing and the, and the research life cycle but and so we want we want to train them up and, and uh, have them understand what are the issues that we want to find out from researchers so that we can help them and, and get their data exposed so they're also our, our biggest asset, I guess, in terms of numbers, and uh, and so we're we're going embarking on a training program with them at the moment, um, and we've also we're also looking at position descriptions and uh, what are the types of uh, people we need? Are there dedicated people that are going to sort of be within a, a liaison librarian team that do this kind of work, or is it incorporated into the day-to-day -day work that they do? There's probably a mix of uh, models out there to how we're going to approach that, and we will also be looking at our our team within our digital infrastructure team that manage the repository, and looking at our resourcing and roles, and you know what dedicated resources do we need here to be able to manage this work. So, um, an example of you know a, a set of research data that we've got, uh, it's it's a huge storehouse of, of data that we we've got from a, a previous centre that closed down, and it's that work could potentially you know, go on for years, and we've already spent, you know, I guess four or five months looking at that data, and we know we're only just at the point of we haven't even described it as part of this project yet because it's not not able to be publicly exposed yet. But you know, just analysing what's in that collection and providing advice to uh, there's a steering committee involved with that is a big part, you know, and it's just one collection. So re resourcing and sustainability are big issues, but the we we have our ANS, uh, you know, part of our ANS project we have our steering committee and we're going to uh, re-engineer that steering committee to be probably a, a, a subcommittee of our research and graduate studies committee, one of our official committees at the university that will then oversee the project from then on and, and that will involve as many stakeholders as we can from ICT, from e-research, uh, research and from faculties and departments themselves and the library so that hopefully will keep uh, people well informed of what work we're doing and getting the word out there, but also the need for resourcing and management of this as a, a you know, a whole service for the university. 
Thank you very much. That's probably unless there are any other questions, it's probably not a bad note to end on. Um, I, I recommend if you haven't seen it that you ha have a look at the short video that we've made on the Latrobe project with the team, uh, so that you can see who's who. Uh, and I'm sure that um, Simon, Roderick, and Charlie would be happy to ask, answer any questions if you've got them uh, by email or or phone or whatever. Um, so I, at, that, at this point, we might wrap it up. And I'd just like to thank you, Roderick, Simon, and Charlie, um, for sharing this. Uh, your approach to identification, I think, has interested a lot of people, uh, and particularly uh, entering into that discussion about the, the, the changes that are afoot. So thank you very much.